How is that? Isn't that what it's all about? <laughs> if I don't speak, I don't care. <laughs> if we're looking at Jesus, that's the point, right? That's the point. He's the point. You guys can sit. Man, what an honor. What an honor to be here. You guys are amazing. Andrew told me about you guys and your faithfulness to meet together and just to seek the Lord and to know Him more. And I am honored. I am honored to be able to speak to you today and to share from my heart what I feel like the Lord is saying and what He's doing and how He's stirring us. Man, if I'm going to get emotional, <laughs> just so you guys know. I don't know if it's that you guys just carry Jesus so well, and I feel it, and you know him, and I know him. So this is going to be great. Amen. Um, so I'm Nicole, and I have been a missionary, and it said on the little flyer, so I figured I'd start there. Um, I've been a missionary for two years, a couple years ago, in Africa and South America. Um... I have a radical salvation story. I did not really know the Lord. I knew of him, but as far as a personal relationship, I, I wasn't walking in that. And I got um, into a car accident where I almost died. My internal organs, like got ripped, my internal intestines got ripped apart in this accident. It was a drunk driver that T-boned the car that I was in. And um, they had to sew me back up. And, and at that point in my life, I was just like, God, you have to show me that you're real. Because I had been clinically depressed my entire life, just living in the world. And um, sad, sad life. <laughs> and uh, at that point, somebody took me to a church that was spirit-filled. And I saw people speaking in tongues and God speaking and signs and wonders and all these miracles. And I'm like, what? God is real. And so from then on, man, it just was a whirlwind. That's, I just went straight into the mission field for those two years because I was just lit for the Lord. I was like, I got um, supernaturally healed of depression. That I had taken pills since I was like eight years old for depression every day. And um, when I encountered the Lord, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I saw a vision of the roaring line of Judah and he, I, everything in me was just black and dark. And when he opened his mouth, light came out as he roared over me. And he filled me with light from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Mm -hmm. And I never took a pill for depression again. Mm -hmm. He miraculously, miraculously healed me. Healed my mind, healed my heart, just healed me. And made me new. Mm -hmm. And just, I was like, we're going to the nations. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody yeah. needs what I found. And so the first place that I went to, supernaturally, of course, you guys know what it is to walk with the Lord. He provides in crazy ways, man. Mm -hmm. He's so outside of our thinking, so outside of our boxes. that It's just like, why put him in a box anymore? Why not just give up our boxes and say, God, do the impossible? Because that's what you do. Mm -hmm. You're a God of the impossible. Um, so the first place I went to was Africa. If anybody knows Heidi Baker ministries. Yeah. yeah, I went I went with Heidi Baker and I went to her school of missionaries and I actually lived there for about 6 months and it was it was an adventure. Mm -hmm. I preached in prisons, I preached in hospitals, I saw the lame walk, the deaf. I when I was preaching in a prison, I shared my testimony. It was a bunch of men. <laughs> and I'm in this prison in Africa and I shared my testimony. And all of them, there's so many weeping coming up for prayer. And I pray for this one guy, and he can't hear. He's deaf. And so I put my hands on him. I don't even know what I prayed, but it doesn't matter because it's just God. You know, <laughs> I can't do that. Only God can do that. So I prayed for him, and his ears opened. Wow. And um, it's just amazing things like that the whole entire time. Just signs and wonders, signs and wonders. The guy that was lame, I would go to the markets. And in Africa, um, <laughs> It's really funny because in this, at least this part, this northern Mozambique part of Africa that I was in, they don't really show expression. Like, they can get healed, like a leg can grow out, and they're just kind of stoic. And I'm like, did, did, do you see what happened? Did, were you there? And um, so this one guy, he was lame from a motorcycle accident, and I was just walking into a store in the village, and I prayed for him, and he hadn't been able to walk for over 10 years, maybe 12, 14, I don't remember, something like that. 
and I lay my hands on him again don't know what I prayed doesn't matter it's God and I just said get up be healed in Jesus name and he got up and he walked Amen. and this is a God we serve yes. and and we come to him with our things like I don't think my heart can be healed I can't make this bill mm -hmm. you know like these minute little things he can make the lame walk Amen. where's our faith church I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now where, <laughs> where is my faith Amen. if he can make lame walk and the deaf hear what is a bill to him what is what is a, a heart thing that we need to work out to him he's like I can touch you in a moment I can touch you in a moment don't you know how much I love you I feel like that's his constant question to us it's his constant question to me don't you know don't you know how much how much I love you um, so that's a little tad bit in Africa and then I have a period of rest and the Lord says, all right, next we're going to South America. And I'm like, yes! I am South American in my roots. I'm Colombian and uh, Mexican. So I'm like, let's go, Lord. So I travel with Iris Ministries as a missionary um, from the northern tip to the southern tip and back up again was this trip for um, South America. And so, again, same thing. It's just like miracle signs and wonders everywhere we're going we're preaching and catholic churches baptist church every church imaginable it's like god was opening doors everywhere that we went mm -hmm. and one time this is actually really funny because one of the most memorable miracles out of that whole trip is a day that i took off <laughs> you don't take off from jesus you know you know we're all we're like missionaries 24 7 you don't take off from holy spirit um, but I took a day off to rest, and I went to the nail salon. We were in Brazil at that time. And as she's working on uh, my feet, I can tell she's in a lot of pain. And I'm like, what, what happened? What's wrong? And um, she told me that she had gotten in a motorcycle accident. And you, have, has anyone heard of Todd White in this room? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Todd White, <laughs> I remember hearing him preaching. And he, I've only been saved for like two years at this point, really walking with the Lord, saved. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I have heard this guy, Todd White, say that there's metal in people's bodies, and he prays for them and they disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm saying, well, I have the same Jesus he does. Mm -hmm. I have the same Holy Spirit he does. So I tell this lady, I've heard of this guy that does this, so that's what's going to happen. And the Holy Spirit's boldness comes over me, and I lay my hands on her and pray for her, and I just feel the fire of God coming through me and she starts crying and she's like fuego fuego fire fire it feels like fire and she had metal I could feel the metal rod and the me metal um, knobs in her leg mm -hmm. disappear under my hand mm -hmm. and she's just bawling her eyes out and I'm like how much pain no pain and, and it was this crazy miracle of my day off from the Lord and I mm -hmm. end up just preaching the gospel right there because who can say that God's not real at that mm -hmm. point and, uh, and people give their lives to Jesus. And that was um, one of the most memorable stories. But just story after story of that, when we really lay our lives down for the Lord and go, there's, it's limitless what he can do. Mm -hmm. um, so I just felt stirred to share some testimonies, because yeah. testimonies stirs up our faith, you know? Mm -hmm. There's one other story where, um, as in South America, I feel, I, I feel led to share this in particular. I don't know if somebody here has struggled with cancer tumors, but I was um, preaching at a woman's conference, and I had everybody come up for healing, for prayer, and this one lady came up and she said, I've had a tumor in my stomach, and I was like, well, God's going to make that disappear, so I just lay my hand on her, again, don't know what I prayed, it's God, and um, she's crying, and then a couple, it's a three-day conference, a couple days later, she comes back, and she says, I had, um, what are those called? Scans? I had a, I had a MRI CAT scan, one of those. And uh, it's not there anymore. The tumor disappeared. Um, it's just, man, he, like we have to stir ourselves. We have to stir ourselves with stories of his faithfulness, with, with things that he's done for us that we've seen. Because the enemy always likes to get us in these places where we can't see anything but what's right in front of us. This bill, this heart issue. And God's like, don't you remember? Don't you remember who I've been? Don't you remember? That's why the Israelites made these little rock, you know, things everywhere they went as testimony to remind them of the faithfulness and goodness of God. 
Because even when we don't see it made manifest in the problem right here, he is an ever-manifesting God. Amen? Amen. Ever-manifesting, ever-faithful. We have to know his character in nature. We see his character in nature, and then he takes us into seasons that work out our salvation, that work out our faith in him. But he gives us those things to remind us, this is who I am. Walk with me. This is who I am. You can trust me. Um, so <laughs> I felt led to, to share those testimonies. And something that the Lord has really convicted me with over the years is hearing, hearing a lot of speakers speak, a lot of them share the high, heights, the highlights, the mountaintop experiences with the Lord. And they're like, all oh, these signs and wonders and miracles, and that's amazing. That's who God is. But I don't really hear preachers much talking about the lows. I don't really hear them talking about the hard places, the deserts, as near as much. And what I've seen come from that, even in my own life, is a church that is ill-equipped to walk through those places. Almost like if I'm not at the highest of the heights, if I'm not seeing all these miracles, signs, and wonders, and all these like, crazy manifestations, something must be wrong with me. I must not be where God wants me. But let me tell you, church, just because you're not in that place does not mean you are not where God wants you. It does not. Look at the stories of the great heroes of faith. Mm -hmm. Do you think David was always on the mountaintops? No, no, no. David had a story of being in the valley until he became king. Valley after valley after valley. Who else? Joseph? Gideon. Gideon? Mm -hmm. There's so many heroes of faith that were, were like, well, we should always be here. And these heroes of faith were like trudging their whole life, you know? Mountaintop trudge, 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 mountaintop trudge, trudge. We're going to make it. And, we, and, I, and so I felt like the Lord really wanted me to vulnerably open up and share um, just the season that I've been in and what I've been through because I feel like in vulnerability, actually one of my friends told me this, I was so nervous because it's been years really since I've preached to a congregation. I did it those two years countless times, but then I went through a wilderness season. Mm -hmm. And I was so nervous, and I was like, listen, I don't know if this is too vulnerable, if this is too raw. And she told me, that's what the people need. That's where you see Jesus the most. And that touched me. That touched me, because that's true. You saw vulnerability in the way Jesus walked his life. And I think that's what we're missing in the church. Mm -hmm. we're we want to talk about all the good things, but let's talk about when our hearts are raw and open before the Lord, and how he's still good there. Uh, so let me let me just look at my notes because I don't want to speak for 12 hours. <laughs> I want to make sure I keep you guys on time. Um, so I went through this season um, after all the heights and the preaching and the and the miracle signs and wonders, and at that it was kind of like Mount Top to the Valley for me. And it's probably been two or three years now since I've been in this season of just, I've, of course there's still miracles, of course God is still moving because that's who he is. But not anything like what I knew. Because it came to a place where all these hard, hard life, life happened. And there was intense, intense betrayal in my life from entire communities, from friends, from relationships. I had a failed engagement. Um, intense betrayal from church leaders, people that were supposed to be my covering. Um, sickness, there was a season that I went through where I literally could not walk. I was bedridden for about two months and I had to move back in with my parents and I couldn't, I could hardly eat. It was like I slept for most every day and night through the night and the two or three hours that I, I could be awake, I was trembling, crying, having panic attacks. I didn't know what was going on with me. And the, the scripture that I held on to in that time was a couple, it's one where he surrounds us with songs of deliverance. Mm -hmm. Even when we don't know what's going on, he does. Mm -hmm. 
And in that place, he surrounds us with songs of deliverance. And we just have to wait and have faith in him that he's doing that, mm -hmm. even when it doesn't make sense. And another scripture that I held on to was, even though my flesh and my heart, my heart may fail me, you remain my strength and my portion forever. Mm -hmm. My body was literally failing me and my heart from all the trauma that I had been through. Literally, it was failing me. But in that place, he's asking, will you hold on to me? In that place. And I learned. <laughs> I'm learning, and I learned how to do that. Um, so just a, a, a season of real trauma, real-life trauma, just from every angle throughout that time, financial crisis, all kinds of things. And that's kind of been my season, and learning how to find the Lord in that place, and learning how to know that I'm still chosen in that place. Just because you're in the valley does not mean that you are not with God. He is close to the brokenhearted, mm -hmm. to the contrite in spirit. He's close. Mm -hmm. um, so, if it is okay with you guys, <laughs> this is. Are you okay with me being very raw? Yes. yes. Very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Very real. Uh, I wrote. Who knows about spoken word? Anybody spoken word? Slam poetry. <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so the Lord told me to write one <laughs> and uh, has anointed me to do so. So I did, and it was from my season of pain that I'm currently still walking through. And if it's okay with you, I know it's a little not normal, but we need not normal yeah. in the church. Yes. So I just wanna share this because the Lord led me to share this with you guys. Um, so here it goes kind of sums up my season. I know pain. It's been one of my closest friends, and not friend like companion, but a friend that's ripped me open until it's made me a champion. A friend that told me the truth, even when it felt like cutting off every one of my limbs and letting it loose, ripping me from all comfortability, shaking me from all formalities, uprooting truly the inner blasphemy until there was just me. I had to face me and ask myself, am I the kind of woman that would run or do I buckle up and face my pain like a loaded gun saying, here I am, shoot me. Cause I know you're the only thing that can change me and I won't cry for mercy until your work is done. Shoot past the glass of human frailty into my true identity, place a crown on my head and make me a queen. In this race of who I was into who I was made to be faithful have been these wounds of these friends closer than a brother loyal to the end. My first friend's betrayal, gut-wrenching betrayal. I let him close, real close, because he came in the form of a man that I thought held every one of my dreams, my desires, my plans, and just as I unfolded the most vulnerable part of me, exposing myself bare for his hands to take and his eyes to see, he stabbed me deep and mercilessly in the most tender part of my flesh, blood and water pouring from my side, a desperate mess he ran like a bandit into the night, stealing my light, robbing me of my very life. And what hurts the most is it's always the ones that are so close that run by his side. My second faithful friend, first name judgment, second accusation, following me like a cloud, filled with voices raised, booming loud in my greatest time of need. The crowds turn their backs, joining the chants of malice and hate, completely irate, destroying my honor, my character, my integrity, based on he said, she said, religious profanity, greater than thou complex, bearing down on me, spitting on my name, grounding it in the dirt to forever be shamed and all I could do was stay silent like a lamb led to the slaughter quiet eyes bleak tears rolling down my cheeks how how could they do this to me my third friend utter rejection his result straightforward and simple he's like a temple i was forced to live in abandoned forsaken unseen filled with idols that shoved me to my knees of total solitude casted out deemed worthless these friends 
different faces, different names, but all representing pain. What if I told you they weren't our enemy? But the very thing that could set you free, the thing that could differentiate you from me, meaning creating individuality, leading into your destiny, into finding your strength. What if instead of tiptoeing around your pain, continuously trying to just miss the rain, you faced it with no quarrel or qualm and went through it, through the tears and the suffering, through the angst and the agony, through the rips in your sails and the raging sea, you could find the land of breakthrough. If only you push through, past defeat, into healing and into release. And don't you dare say that you can't because you can. I did. Because I know a man who lives, who welcomed these friends but didn't bend, who knew great pain but didn't bow to it, who walked on water and split it, who had his flesh ripped to shreds and forgave it who set his face like flint and conquered for you, for me, a man who knew great pain, every name, but never faltered. You can, like I did. That's it. <laughs> um, I felt like I should share that because I felt like we need to be real. We need to be real to see that someone can be in that kind of pain, in that kind of trauma, and encounter and find the Lord there. And that in that place, he's still just as close as a place on the mountaintop where we're seeing signs and wonders. He's just as close, if not closer. He cannot, he cannot deny a broken contract. It's not who he is. He's our Abba. He's our Father. What father can see his child in pain when they have nothing to give, no works, nothing that they can possibly give him, and turn away from them? What good father would embrace their child and say, I'm here. You're going to make it. It's okay. So this season is a season that I'm currently still in, still working through that pain, and I'm still here talking to you today. That's the God we serve. He can use the heights and the lows. And how, uh, when I heard that this, this message was about expectancy, I was like, oh, great. I can share like the depths of agony and share that we can still be expectant in that place. That was probably not what you were going to think that you were going to hear. But that's what the Lord wants to share. He wants to share that because he, he wants us to know how in the place of greatest human agony, of betrayal, of angst, of total aloneness, this is really funny. So when I heard about this, I was like, I'm going to bring a whole slew of people to prophesy <laughs> over everyone. They're going to be my prophetic team. This is going to be awesome. And probably like three days before, every single person told me they couldn't. That's probably God. <laughs> Even though it doesn't seem like that's God, that's probably God. So that I can stand here today and say, when you have no one, mm -hmm. when you have no one, you have to know how to hold on to him. Yeah. And that's what these places are about. That's what these valleys are about. He wants us to know that he's there in the mm -hmm. hard places so that we can make it through what's coming. Mm -hmm. So that we can make it through the heights with a humble heart before him. So that we know how to hold on while he's holding on to us. Yeah. Um, so in a place of agony, how can you know and be expectant of God? You have to know who he is. You have to know that he's good in a place where it doesn't make sense. I, I want to share the scripture. I'm going to be sharing a lot of scriptures. So if you guys want to crack open your Bibles or your apps, whatever works for you. Um, so in one of the many hard times in these past three years, this is a scripture that I've really hold, held on to. I just kind of stumbled upon it, and I was like, man, this is what you're forming in my heart, God. This is what you're doing. 
um, the knowledge of this, and I don't mean head knowledge, I mean heart knowledge. The knowledge, knowing how, like when it talks about um, Adam knowing Eve, to know God that way. Um, so this is a scripture. It is Psalm 62, 12. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God. With you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they've done. Two things I've needed to know most about God in the depths of my despair has been that he's powerful and that he's loving. Those are the two things that I've had to hold on to throughout the time when things don't make sense. And so that scripture has spoken to me a lot. And what's really cool is that his name, God, in the original Anglo-Saxon language, translates literally to good. His very name. His, like, we all have names that we've been given that usually are a reflection of who he's created us to be. But his very name is good. So to know that, to, be, to, to know that in the hard places, I feel like that's where, what he's forming inside of us. And, um, yeah, so that's, a, that's one of the scriptures. And in a time when nothing makes sense, I was worshiping the Lord. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes he'll have me do movements um, just in worship to him. And I'm sure I look crazy, but that's okay, because I can be more undignified. <laughs> um, so at one point I was doing this over and over again. And I was like, God, what am I doing? And he'll show me what I'm doing in heaven. And so as I'm doing this before him, I see that I'm, I'm taking off the top of my head, and it turns into a crown. And I throw it at his feet over and over and over and over again. And the Lord tells me, that's the crown of understanding. Will you worship me, or will you worship your understanding? And that, from then on, with that scripture, has spoken to me so much. Because ooh, it's so easy to see what's in front of us and worship that thing. But are we going to worship the things that we cannot understand? Or are we going to worship him for his goodness, for his love? Um, there's another thing that the Lord's been really teaching me, and that's um, about the faith of Abraham. That man had understand, like he knew how to know the Lord and worship the Lord beyond understanding. Like we probably haven't even fathomed. Um, and so this scripture I wanted to share was about Abraham's resilient expectation in the Lord. And it is Romans 4, 20 through 21. It says, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. This man was beyond age to have children. And the Lord tells him that he's going to. Can we talk about something hopeless that looks absolutely just bizarre? <laughs> there's no way, there's no way that this is even possible, God. And yet, he did not waver. He was fully convinced. And it says that Abraham hoped against all hope. That is a faith he is forming in us. He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. Even when we're faithless, he is a faithful God. And he's forming that faith within us through the valleys. In the times when we don't see him, he's forming the faith that he is here. And he's just as capable to move now that he was then. Um, so we have a God that doesn't think our thoughts. We have a God that's far above what we could ask, think, or imagine. And that's the expectancy that he's forming inside of us. Um, so in another part of my life <laughs> recently, that's been very difficult. I had a friend sit me down and kind of counsel me because I was just kind of at my end about everything. I was like, listen, I've been going through all this betrayal. I've been going through all this health stuff. I was one po point where my skin was just crazy and I, I couldn't heal it. I didn't know what to do. And um, I was going through all this financial stuff and I just gave her a list. And I was like, how 
How could God expect me to think that he is good in this place? And she said, Nicole, the Lord wants you to know that he is good in this place. And I was like, oh. Because <laughs> here I am, like, waiting for these situations to change, you know? Like, I will know that he's good when these situations change. Because how could I believe he's good if all these things are just so terrible? And she's like, exactly. <laughs> That's what he's forming in you. That's what he's asking you to step out of the boat, cast your net where it doesn't, where it doesn't make sense, and say, in this place. In this place, you're good. Because Jesus, I don't want to be a fair-weather friend to Jesus. He died for us. You guys know what he went through for us, the agony, literal death for us. I don't want to give him back fair-weather friendship. I say, no, I'm good. This is too hard. You can't be good in this place. I, he's, he's deserving of our faith. He's deserving of our heart. In a hard place, he's deserving of our life. He's deserving of us. So, um, in that place, the Lord spoke to me also about Joseph. Um, and I don't want to get away from this. I feel like I'm supposed to talk about. We, we are called to covenant with God. We are called to marriage with Jesus. That's not... Like, when the going gets tough <laughs> in marriage, if we do it the Lord's way, you don't run. You don't say, I'm done. You don't say, I, I don't have what it takes to work through this. He gave us what it takes to work through anything with him, in union with him. A covenant, a marriage, is when you're one with someone and you can't be separated. And that's what he's calling us into. He's calling us into the good and the bad. He's calling in, us into vows with him. Um, and I really, yeah. Let, can you just, let's just put our hands on our hearts. Let's just tell Jesus. Jesus, I'm your bride. Jesus, I'm in covenant with you. I don't want to be a fair weather friend to you. Jesus, here is my heart. It's yours. Teach me union with you. Teach me how to stay as one with you in my heart and in my mind. Jesus, you are my husband, my bridegroom. Form in my heart faithfulness as your bride to you. Form in my heart enduring love true love, covenant love. In Jesus' name. Yes, God, do it, God. Um, so, in that time when I was like, uh, I had, so I had this crazy time of ministry that I told you guys about, where I am just on fire, preaching everywhere, getting asked to preach everywhere, seeing signs and wonders, and then the Lord just brings me into this season of like, nothing like that just really hard, deep tragedies happening in my life and no, no real empowerment in ministry because the Lord's like, I want to do something different. I want, I want the intimacy of your heart in this season. And so that, even though that's the, Lord, the season the Lord has you in, he puts things in our heart for a due time. And when we're in a season that's not time yet, that doesn't mean the desire is not in your heart. It's very much there. And that's patience that he forms in us. And so in this time of darkness for me, my heart's been wrestling and struggling. And I'm like, God, I know what I'm created for. I'm created to do all these crazy things for you and to preach and to see the sick healed and the lame walk. And, and I'm stuck. <laughs> you just have me here in this place of intimacy and rest. And I have to go <laughs> do these things, God, for you. And... Um, and, and it, it just felt like I got to a place finally where it just felt like I'm not chosen by God. I'm just not chosen by him because it's been years of destitute, desolation, and, and not walking in my calling and just like feeling like I couldn't even walk in it if I had open doors because I'm just so broken. And just feeling like this, that I'm like, okay, okay God, like 
after all this betrayal and after all these people like cutting me out of ministry and all these things, I must just not be chosen by you. That must be it. <laughs> and God spoke to me and he said, look at Joseph. Look at how many people betrayed him, mm -hmm. cut him out, mm -hmm. threw him in a pit. Talk about betrayal, his brothers. Threw him in a pit to die. Mm -hmm. And Joseph, all that he went through wasn't evidence that he wasn't chosen. Mm -hmm. It was evidence that he was. Mm -hmm. And God spoke to me and said, all these things that have happened in your life, this season that you're in, it's evidence that I've chosen you and I care so much about your heart that I want to form you and prepare you to carry out such a calling. Mm -hmm. And that's what it does. I remember Graham Cook once told a story about um, like there's this big thing in a vision that he saw and it was like this stone thing and there was two people chipping away at it and it was carving something that Magnificent and glorious and it was him and the Lord spoke to him and there had been two people that were following him around everywhere um, just bashing him just cutting him down telling rumors about him betraying him like just everywhere he went it was like persecution mm. and um, and, he, and the Lord showed him this vision and then the Lord showed him the faces of the people that were making him into this glorious thing and it was the faces of those people that we're following him with persecution. So when we are in these bad times, these hard times, these valleys, and it's not the mountaintop, God is with us. He is good in that place. He's forming us in that place into something beautiful. So God assured me, you are chosen in this place. And I saw, um, I saw this, other thing that the Lord was saying about being chosen um, in a book recently, and it says, Joseph's promotion was from the pit to prison. That was a promotion. Mm -hmm. And the reason that was a promotion every time, even though to us that's like, what? <laughs> this sucks, you know? Like, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Um, but the Lord says that it's promotion because every time the Lord was working out a fence in his heart, if we have a fence in our heart, the, the, it says in the Bible that tormentors can, mm -hmm. can come at us if we have unforgiveness. Mm -hmm. If we have a fence in our heart, we can't walk out the fullness of our calling. And we don't want to, church. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want to be in a place where we're, we're walking out our calling and Satan has a hook in us like that. Mm -hmm. So in that time where Joseph was being promoted, even though it didn't look like promotion, he was being promoted in the spirit. Mm -hmm. He was being promoted by getting all this offense towards God and towards man worked out of his heart so that he could be in the place where God called him to be. Mm -hmm. He was also learning humility. Because the Lord had told him from the beginning, before his family even threw him in a pit, the Lord told him, hey, this is what I have planned for you. And then he goes and blabs it to everyone. <laughs> and then they throw him in the pit. So we can learn from that. You probably don't want to blab everything to everyone. Um, <laughs> guilty. So... <laughs> So, so he could have easily, easily taken offense to God mm -hmm. in that place. Like, how dare you, God? How dare you tell me this great, grandiose calling from you that you promised me? And where am I? I've been in, in the pit, left to die. I'm in prison. Who knows when I'm getting out? Can you imagine? Joseph probably thought at one point, I'm probably never getting out of here. Mm -hmm. What's this, God? You know, like, <laughs> I have felt that way. I have felt very much like Joseph in a prison, and I'm like, this is what you told me, God. This is what you told me. But he calls that promotion. Mm -hmm. He calls that promotion because he's working out a fence, and he's creating humility in our hearts, mm -hmm. and he's preparing us for coming out of prison into our calling. And the best thing that we can do in that place, I once heard a preacher say this, and I was like, mind blown. I will forever remember that. <laughs> he said, you don't, that God told him, you do not need more anointing. You need to learn how to yield. I was like, oh, wow. So much we cry out to God for the power of God, for the gifting, for the miracle. We just need to learn how to open ourselves and yield to him and say whatever you want. Whatever it looks like. It doesn't have to look like what I thought. All these signs and wonders. It can, like, my life, 
the past three years has looked like simple, like smiling at people, hugging people, resting in the Lord. And that's what he called me to. Mm -hmm. So we have to get out of this, like, this thing of it has to look like this. It has to look like you yielding to the Lord. That's what it has to look like. It has to look like obedience. Yes. It has to look like saying whatever you want, whatever you want to do. That's what it has to look like. Uh, let me get back on the subject here. I'm way <laughs> off. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this was also really good along with events. Um, I, I heard another message that was about the testings of Jesus. And I went through a really hard season in the beginning of these hard seasons chapter of my life. Um, where it was kind of like everything I could ever want was offered to me on a silver platter. But I knew that it wasn't the Lord. I knew that it wasn't the Lord. For sure it wasn't the Lord. But it was like so tempting. Because <laughs> it was just like, you can have it. And, and I was like, and it was in a form of a relationship. And it ripped me to pieces. It tore everything in me to say no to that and to cut ties with that. I, it just... It was excruciating. It was the greatest sacrifice of my life. Yet. <laughs> Who knows what God has? Who knows what he has? Um, <laughs> he's God of the hills and the valleys. Okay, yes. We've been, we're learning that. Um, so it was hard. And that was much like the first testing of Jesus, where Satan took him into the wilderness. And, mind you, it was Holy Spirit that led him into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So, yes. next time we want to say, this is so hard, this is a terrible place, this is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> that could be Holy Spirit <laughs> wanting to work out some hard things in you and, and walk with you in that place. So, um, leads him into the wilderness. Holy Spirit has him there. I'm sure that didn't make much sense to him either at the time. <laughs> Forming that surrender and yieldedness. And uh, Satan comes to him and he says, everything you want, you can have anything you want. And he was starving. I don't know about y'all, but I, if I'm hangry, <laughs> I, like, I don't know if I could do that, okay? Like, I just get so hungry. It's, it's scary when I'm hangry. But um, in this place where Jesus, I'm sure, is hangry 40 days, 41 days, and um, he comes to him, whatever you want, I, I can turn this stone into bread. I can give you all these cities that you can rule over all of them. You can have whatever you want. And Jesus in that place, what did he say? He counteracted with the word, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. He gave the word back to Satan. And, and that's how he overcame his first trial. Second trial before his death, what was it? Does anyone know? The betrayal. The betrayal of his closest friends. So in the first, in the first um, time that he had of testing, it was that he counteracted with the word. In his second time of testing, even the Lord was tested. Even Jesus, son of man, son of God, was led through the forming of his character. Mm -hmm. He grew in favor with men and God. Mm -hmm. Even Jesus, and that's why we have a high priest that can know, know what we're walking through. Mm -hmm. um, so the second testing, the, the counteraction of the word didn't work in that place. Because it was much more personal than that. It was much more close to his heart than that. It was a, it was a testing of his heart. Mm -hmm. In a place where you could find great offense, mm -hmm. and justifiably so. <coughs> justified him so his closest friends that he had given his life for that he had walked with that he had taught that he had eaten with broken bread with shared his closest secrets with his he gave his time to gave his life to he wasn't married those were his friends mm -hmm. those, those were his life in that time um they betrayed him mm -hmm. and they gave him up to be crucified and and the people crucifying him were the very people that he was saving yeah. Talk about offense. You want to take up offense? Like, think about being murdered by the people that you're saving. Mm -hmm. So in that place, the counteraction of the word didn't help. 
What was needed is in that place, learning how to give offense up and saying, I choose love. I choose mercy. I choose grace. In the place of greatest betrayal, I choose mercy. And that was his testing, and he passed. And now look what happened. <laughs> we can learn something from that. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, man, like, what's next for me? Because I went through the first testing. I'm going through the second one. What's next? <laughs> but that's encouragement um, for us to know that something is being formed in us, right, that is teaching us how to be unoffendable, that's getting us to the next place unoffendable with God and unoffendable with man. When things don't, when we don't understand things and when things hurt us, how can we remain unoffendable so we can walk into our calling? Like what Jesus did. These are very real testings that we're going through. And I would encourage you to ask the Lord, Lord, what testing am I going through right now? Because Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. We have to know what our joy is. And sometimes our joy can just look like knowing him more. Mm -hmm. What greater joy is there than that? Right. You know? Mm -hmm. What greater joy to know union and closeness and fellowship with him? So I encourage you to ask that. Um, a story that's really encouraged me in the Bible is when Paul, just for many reasons, but when Paul is preaching, and he's just preaching the gospel, going crazy, you know, Paul, the apostle of apostles, the preacher of all preachers, he wrote most of the New Testament, and he's just preaching the gospel, and the snake uh, bites him, it's a poisonous, venomous snake, he could die, mm -hmm. and instead of Paul saying, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die, you know, freaking out and focusing on that snake, what did he do? He's preaching, he grabs it, he throws it in the fire, and he keeps preaching the gospel. That is the tenaciousness that's being built inside of us. I'm not there yet, but that's what we're working for, you know? That's what we're working for instead of, my bills, I can't make them, or this pain, this betrayal. This is the Lord. That's what he's forming. That's what he's forming in us. Um, so, the gospel is obviously a message of expectancy and of not losing hope. And um, one, in, in a season where it was really hard for me to not lose hope, and it just seemed like everything was just dead, like no ministry, no, no, like even like being alive in my heart. I felt dead in my heart because of all the trauma and offense that I had been through, just everything dead. I felt like everything was dead. And somebody prophesied over me and they said, I see this forest in the dead of winter and all the trees are barren. And you're looking around like, will, will this ever be alive? And it was my heart. Like, will, will this ever be alive? It's just dead of winter. Everything's dead. And the Lord says to me, it's not dead. It's ready. <laughs> and that has really spoken to me. Um, he also said, everything... When he said, it's not dead, it's ready. And I said, God, but it's so cold and empty. He said, no, it's not, it's clear. Mm -hmm. That is what God is forming in us in the barren season. He is clearing things out for us and preparing things so that we're ready. Mm -hmm. So that we're ready to receive and run in what he's called us to. So we're not dead. Mm -hmm. What looks dead is not dead dead. It's clear and it's ready. That's how the Lord sees it. Hey man, hallelujah. I need to remember that one. Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me, Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, so I want to share two scriptures with you guys, if y'all want to turn to me with them. Whew. So, this one is in Hebrews 10. I'm going to kind of jump around in that one, so you might not be able to follow me exactly, but um, it's where Paul is encouraging the church. And he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. 
Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you receive what he's promised. This very much reminds me of when he's correcting the church and he's saying in Revelations, and he's like, everything you've done great, you've done all the works that you're supposed to do, you've loved each other well, like all these different things that the church has done good, the Lord is commending them. Mm -hmm. But then he sa says, but this one thing I have against you, you have left your first love. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it sound like that? Remember those earlier days when you first received the light and you endured great conflict full of suffering. We cannot grow weary, church. We cannot grow weary because when we endure, we receive what he's promised. He's a faithful God no matter what it looks like. He's a good God no matter what the journey looks like to get to the promise that he's promised us. The promise of his fullness, the promise of our destiny, whatever the promise is that you're contending for, do not grow weary. Remember when you were first in love. When you were first in love with the Lord, how full of faith you were. How full of expectancy. Return back to that. We don't want him to have that against us. We don't. We want to return with our hearts. Rend your heart open. I feel like the Lord is just calling us to that. Rend your heart open. Repent of unbelief. Repent of not being expected. Repent of those things and return to me. Return to the faith and expectancy you had when you were first in love. Right? Because when, I know this, I'm in a relationship right now. When you're first in love, it's like, woo! We can, we can endure anything, no matter what happens. We are in this to win this, and this is awesome. You know? Like, that's when you first fall in love. Yeah. And then you, like, get lied to, you know? You know, like, what? there's all kinds of hits that you can take in relationship. Mm -hmm. And we can very much feel like we're taking those hits from God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, like Joseph could have. Mm -hmm. You're not being faithful to what you promised me. I'm in prison, you know? Mm -hmm. But he's a God that's outside of time. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that he's doing so many things that we are not aware of. Mm -hmm. um, so in this place, you know, you're taking all these hits. You think you're taking them from God and from people. And then you can get to a, to a place where, like, you're struggling for that love. It's like, man, like, I cannot take anymore. Like, I just can't take anymore. I, my heart has been too beat up. And the Lord's saying, hey, before all that offense happened, before you took all those hits that you thought were from me, before all that pain and trauma came in and all the disillusionment and the loss of hope, before all that happened, return. Return to that place. We can get through anything. I'm so in love. That's what he's calling us to. That's what he's calling us to. One more scripture. Y'all okay with that? Yes. All right. Revelations 3, 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Okay, pause really quick right there. So when it says strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, he's talking about faith. Strengthen your faith. If it's in this place where you've gotten all these hits and all this betrayal and you're like, I can't take anymore, strengthen it. Remind yourself of testimonies. Remind yourself that he is good, that he is powerful, that he is God, that he is kind. Remind yourself of those things and strengthen your faith till you're back to the first love that you once had. Get back to that intimate place. Sometimes, man, for me, warring, warring warfare looks like laying down and letting him love me. That's what warfare looks like. Sometimes it looks like just getting crazy in worship. You know, like, I will worship you. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how I feel. Just getting wild. Just whatever it takes to get you back to the place of first love and intimacy with him where you see his face. In the Hebrew language, there is no word for presence. If y'all don't Bible study, I encourage you to because you miss so much if you don't see the root words of things. But presence in the Hebrew translates literally to face. The face of God. To get back 
to that intimate place of first love, you have to look at his face. That's the way it gets us back. Look at his face. Be in the presence of God. Seek his face. There, oh, recently, I gotta tell this really quick. Pause on the, y'all keep your Bible open. <laughs> I am a nanny. I'm 28 and I'm a nanny. <laughs> it's okay. God is working on me being unoffendable. <laughs> it's okay. I'm unoffendable, Jesus. Um, so I nanny this little boy, and he is precious. But he has his days. Mm -hmm. And one day he was just like freaking out, like throwing crazy tantrum. And I'm like, whoa, what is going on? And he couldn't see me where he was. He was like sitting looking this way. Bah! And so I'm, I'm over here and I'm like, wait, calm down. And I look as soon as I lock eyes with him, as soon as I see his face. And I was like, oh my God. And then I heard a TED Talk right after that. Does anybody know about TED Talk? Yes. They're great. I, I listened to a TED Talk right after. And you know, God speaks through anything. Movies, mm -hmm. TED Talk, whatever. He will speak through it because he is all and is and all. Amen? Yeah. Yes. So he's, in this TED Talk, he talks about how in relationship, if there's something that you need to talk about that's difficult, then you need to be face to face mm -hmm. and body to body, like facing each other. Yeah. Um, because in that place, your heart is open. Mm -hmm. And he can't, it's not as easy to take offense and be defensive because you're face to face. And the Lord spoke to me so much about that, like in my relationship, but my relationship with him. Mm -hmm. It is all about being face to face with him. Mm -hmm. That's how we get back to first love. That's how we get past offense mm -hmm. and all the trauma, being face to face. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was tangent. That one's free. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let's get back to scripture. Strengthen the things which remained. Strengthen your faith. Strengthen your first love. Da -da. And then it says, for I have not found your works perfect before God. So what that reminds me of, when God says, I haven't found your works perfect before me. He, he does not delight in sacrifice. He doesn't delight in us like, trying really hard to be a super Christian. <laughs> like, I'm going to do all these works and I'm going to, like, feed the poor and, and all these things are amazing and great and we should do them as an overflow. Yeah. But when we're doing them outside of the will of God or outside of the presence of Jesus, we're missing it. And so he says, I don't, I don't find delight. Uh, oops. Your works are not perfect before God. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're, they're working so hard, but they're missing the first love. Mm -hmm. They're missing the presence of Jesus. They're missing what it's all about. And um, so that the, those scriptures, um, Psalm 51, 17, on a side note, um, it says that God does not delight in sacrifice. He wants the realness of your heart, even if broken and contrite. Where, where David's like, you know, like you, I would give you bulls. I would sacrifice all these things to you, but, but that's not what you want. Here's my broken and contrite heart. That's what the Lord is after. Those works are awesome. Awesome. If you give them your heart first. You know? Another scripture is uh, where it says he doesn't delight in, in works and sacrifice, but he delights in the obedience to the Lord, no matter what it looks like. That's a story in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Um, that's kind of touched on what we talked about earlier, how he's after obedience. He's after being yielded in the place where you could take offense. Um, and the end of that scripture is, remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, he's talking about the gospel, hold fast and repent. So I am obviously not your ordinary preacher lady. <laughs> I'm obviously a little out of the box. Jesus loves me. It's okay. Uh, so I know we're used to hearing like these super uplifting messages, and it's all about feeling good. But I really feel like the Lord is like, repent. You know, like, <laughs> repent so you can have the fullness. Mm -hmm. Repent. Change your heart so you can live the fullness of the gospel in your destiny. Repent from offense, from hardening of your heart, from losing your first love so you can have it back. Um, so, 
If everybody wants to stand with me, we'll pray through that, and then I'll ask Portia to come and share some things, and then if we have time, we'll prophesy over individuals. All right. So we're going to do the heart thing again, because the Lord is all about the heart. Okay. So just place your hand on your heart. We're going to pray to Jesus. We're going to pray to God. We're going to pray to Abba. And we're going to repent for these things so he can fill us. So you can just uh, repeat after me or say it in your own words. Just pray this with me. (sighs) Abba God. I repent of unbelief. I repent of unbelief. I repent of not having expectancy of your goodness. I repent of offense offense. towards you and towards men. men. I repent repent. from leaving my first love. love. Mm. I repent from letting my heart grow cold. I repent from agreeing with weariness. weariness. Now come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And fill those places in my heart. Fill me with expectancy of all that you are. Fill me with expectancy of all you are. Fill me with your grace, Abba. Fill me with your first love. Fill me with your first love. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now I'm just going to keep staying there and I'm just going to pray over you guys. Jesus, 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 Jesus. King Jesus, you are enough. You are enough for the disappointment. You are enough for the weariness. You are enough for the betrayal. You are enough for the bitterness. All of those things, all of those spirits, I command them to bow at the feet of Jesus. Right now, in all of our hearts, I declare they have no more place and no more voice. Every one of those spirits, silence. From here on out, that we would recognize them as strange. And that in that place, we would have faith. That we would repent and turn from doubt, Abba. You are worthy of our hearts. You are worthy of our hearts. And in these places that are valleys, God, teach us to sing. Teach us to sing. Teach us to praise. Teach us to trust, God. To trust that you are just as good in the valley as you were in the mountaintops. To trust that you're forming something eternal in us that is so much more worth what we think we should have right now on earth. What you're forming is good in us, Abba, and teach us to trust that. Teach us to yield, Lord. I don't want more of anything than more than I want to yield to you. So teach me to yield. Teach me to yield to you, Holy Spirit. You're the only one that knows. You're the only one that knows what we need, what we need to do, what needs to happen. You're the only one. Teach us to yield to you in the mountaintops and in the valleys, God. Teach us to yield and to return to love. When everything is trying to rip us apart, teach us to return to love. I thank you, Jesus, for healing and mending our hearts throughout the process. I thank you that you're faithful to do what you said you'd do. You're faithful to finish what you began in us. You are faithful. Form that faith in us, God, to trust you when we don't understand. We cast our crowns of understanding at your feet. You are worthy, and you are the only one worthy. You are the only one worthy of my acknowledgement, my praise, and my worship. I will not worship understanding. So I bless you, Abba. I bless you, Jesus. And I bless every person in this room to be strengthened and encouraged to let go and disagree with hopelessness and weariness and to put all of their faith in you and in who you say that you are. To put all of their faith in you being faithful from beginning to end that you're getting them somewhere 
glorious. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah.